As a kite by then I miss the earth so much I miss my wife It's lonely out in space On such a time I am less flight
loud sound that seemed to fight Came back like a slow voice on a wave of fight
brow. Mickey Mouse has grown up a cow. Now the workers have struck for fame. Cause lemon's on sale again. See the mice in their million hordes. From Ibiza to the north of Broads. Blue Britannia is out of bounds. To my mother, my dog and clowns. But the film is a sad thing for. Cause I wrote it ten times or more. It's about to be written again. As I ask you to book a song. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
and welcome to the Stratosphere Unveil. Please welcome on stage our first speaker, Edwin Vermeule, CEO of Aerospace Propulsion Products. Ladies and gentlemen, as said by Owen, my name is Edwin Vermeule and I am the CEO, or as you can call it, director of Aerospace Propulsion Products. We say, by the way, APP. APP is a specialist in rocket ignition and um, this year we celebrate our 30th anniversary. So we are doing this al already a while. And I should not forget to say we are since many years a very, very proud sponsor of DARE and the Stratos projects. So I'm honored to be allowed to speak here for just a few minutes to you. It was 21 years ago that I started to work on space projects. My personal motivation and fascination are the launchers, being the only way for humans to reach space. And more specifically, for me, the most fascinating are the rocket engines, these mighty but complicated machines that deliver the incredible amount of energy that we need to get to fight against our gravity and to reach space. And today, 21 years later, um, after I started with this work on in, sp in the space business, I really lost nothing of this motivation and fascination. In the contrary, um, rockets have become, in the last decades, more relevant than ever. Many new rockets arise. Uh, reusability is being developed and brought into practice. And new technologies and approaches um, are, are used, like adaptive labor manufacturing, or electrification, or green propellants. Many other things, big data, electric, uh, 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 electric propulsion also. And these new technologies are changing the way rockets are designed and built, produced, operated, and also the way we put them on the market. For me, and I guess also for you guys, um, being part of the launcher world is the most exciting and coolest thing I can imagine. And the fact that launchers or rockets have been around for a while does not mean that building um, them and operating them has become an easy task. The principle of a rocket, for the ones who do not know that, and you, you guys, you really know this, what I'm going to say now, is do or die. It works or it doesn't work. It flies or it explodes. It brings you to the right place or it leaves, or it leaves a satellite totally useless into space. As rocket engineers, as rocket engine engineers, as launcher engineers, we work on the edge of the technical possibilities. We go to the limits of the materials we use, um, the limits of what our computers and software can do, what our manufacturing skills can do, and to the limits of our intellectual capabilities, which might be, might be not so far in my case, but it's a huge uh, amount in your case. Um, and yes, Sometimes we experience a setback. I've experienced many in my personal career. Maybe it says something about me, but okay. Um, igniters completely destroyed uh, in a test failure. An oxygen fire burning away part of our test facility. Um, a complete Vega motor test, uh, this is a large uh, European launcher, where we participated too with an igniter, where the nozzle failed and was ejected to end up a kilometer, kilometer far away into the ocean. Um, yes, but using all the skills and tools and bright minds we had available, we always learned, we always recovered. So igniters work perfectly these days. Um, we never had a fire again in our facility uh, brought by oxygen. And today... <laughs> I have to be careful here. Uh, and today, Vega has a straight success of 14 launches and many more to come. 
So, ladies and gentlemen of there of the Stratos team, working on rockets is really difficult and results are sometimes disappointing. But personally, I think that recovery from all this gives us the reward that makes our job the coolest one on Earth. Yes, we are rocket scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Ten years ago, this rocket was loaded into the back of a van here in Delft by three aerospace students and driven for four days to Karuna in the north of Sweden. The reason the aerospace students had to drive the rocket there themselves is because no transport company would accept the student-built rocket or the student-built rocket fuel inside of it into their care. Stratos 1 was launched from the S-Range Space Center in Karuna to an altitude of 12.5 kilometers, and it propelled Delft Aerospace Rocket Engineering onto the world rocketry stage. Ten years later, we are gathered here tonight to hear how we intend to finish the journey to the stars that Stratos 1 began. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Owen, and this year I've had the privilege of being the team manager for Stratos 4. You're all very welcome to the Aula, where this evening, on behalf of the Stratos 4 team, I will present to you the Stratos 4 rocket, a rocket entirely designed, built, and hopefully eventually launched by students to the edge of space. But before I present to you the rocket itself, I first want to answer why we want to go to space, and we'll also hear a little bit about the challenges and achievements we've faced along the way. When we unveiled the design of Stratos 4 three months ago, I asked why we as a team have set space, the area above 100 kilometers with no atmosphere, freezing temperatures, and bombarded by radiation as our goal. And back then, I had three reasons. Firstly, space is the final frontier. It's the last true domain of exploration open to humanity. 50 years after we first set foot on the moon, we are still fascinated with space exploration. Secondly, was the opportunity presented in space. Just like a newly discovered land, space is ripe with new resources and applications, as we recently saw with SpaceX's train of satellites passing right over the Netherlands. And lastly, we wanted to democratize space. Space is seen as this far-off, intangible place that doesn't really play a role in our daily lives. However, we as students, right here in our own workshop, are building a rocket capable of going there, and we want to show how it's a lot more accessible and useful in our daily lives than most people really think. Now, these are all valid reasons. However, they're not really complete. I know plenty of people in the Stratos 4 team who aren't here primarily to democratize space, or because they think the technology we build in Stratos 4 will push humanity back out into the universe. For the last 10 months, 70 students have poured most, if not all, of their free time into designing, building, testing, promoting, coding, machining, sewing, managing, and eventually launching this rocket. This has been a human endeavor, and it's likely that all of these 70 people here in front of you have completely different reasons for working on this project. However, what unites them, what brings them all together under one passion, is getting something to space. The proudest moments I've had all year long are every Wednesday evening, after our work sessions, when all 70 members of the Stratos 4 team sit down together to eat dinner. Afterwards, we dive back into work and work late into the night or into the next morning, and seeing 70 people deep in technical conversations, troubleshooting their problems, and trying to figure out some crazy design plans to fix them is really, really inspiring. 70 people from 25 completely different backgrounds, all working towards one goal. And I think, fundamentally, that's more important than any practical reason. But how hard a task really is it, getting something up to space? Often, after you can finish a hike up a mountain, you can turn around and look back down at the patch you took up to admire all your hard work. So let's do the same thing for our trip to space. Starting right outside the aula where we are this evening, firstly, we'll look down from the altitude of the highest building on campus, EWI, which sits around 90 meters high. Now, if we were to go up to here and look straight down, we have a view that spans two kilometers from side to side. So you can see most of the TU Delft campus from here. 
Zooming up to 10 kilometers, which is the altitude of, uh, or the cruising altitude of a commercial airliner, you see 230 kilometers from side to side, and a nice view of most of the Netherlands. Most of you in the audience can probably see your houses from here. And lastly, all the way up to 100 kilometers. Here, even I can see my house back home in Ireland, and the view spans 2,300 kilometers from horizon to horizon. This probably gives you a sense of how high we are going. But we've had the goal of getting here for over 10 years, all the way since Stratos 1. So why do we think we're ready to go there now? This is how the flight of Stratos 3 ended. Stratos 3 was launched from the south of Spain last summer, and initially it took off perfectly. However, 20 seconds into the flight, at an altitude of around 10 kilometers, going three times the speed of sound, Stratos 3 broke up and it broke the hearts of the engineers who'd worked on it for over two years. The team returned to Delft, and they began an investigation. They used both the telemetry that we'd streamed back from the rocket during the flight, as well as the measurements we took from the ground systems, and they were able to piece together quite a complete picture of what happened to Stratos 3. The root cause of its demise is a problem we call pitch-roll coupling, and this happens when the rocket's roll rate, so how quickly it spins around its longitudinal axis, matches the pitch rate, how quickly the rocket moves its nose up and down. And when these two frequencies match each other exactly, the rocket becomes unstable and it flipped around, breaking up in the process. One very important lesson to take away from this picture is the monumental difficulty that is presented when flying rockets. We are pretty unlike a car or a boat. We can't take our rocket out and do a test lap and see how things are going, or pull back into the pit lane when something's a little bit off. We get one shot at launching. It's very hard to draw any parallels between our vehicle and others. Every engine test we conduct takes complete weeks to prepare. We have to entirely rebuild our engine and improve it. We carry no pilot, so our vehicle is completely autonomous and communicates with us from over 100 kilometers away. All very difficult tasks on their own, but monumental when you combine them into one vehicle. So, how did we react? What did we do when Stratos 3, two years in the making, disintegrated only 20 seconds into flight at an altitude of 10 kilometers? We reacted by setting our sights to the finish line of this student space race, 100 kilometers. Now, that probably seems like a bit of a leap, going from disintegrating at 10 kilometers to a successful flight all the way to 100 kilometers. And you'd be correct, there's a fair jump there. But there's three reasons we're confident in taking this jump now. Firstly, the potential of the design. Towards the end of the Stratos 3 project, we saw that the combination of the power of the engine that we had produced, combined with the mass of the vehicle that we'd made, showed that our simulations, that we were getting a peak altitude close to 100 kilometers. Not quite all the way there yet, but we were starting to get close. Secondly, we knew with quite a fair amount of confidence what went wrong with the flight of Stratos 3. Being aware of this pitch roll coupling meant that this year with Stratos 4, we could actively work towards mitigating it and ensuring that Stratos 4 makes it safely all the way to space. And lastly, the competition. I mentioned the finish line to this student space race. Around the world at this very moment are a handful of student rocketry teams, mostly in the United States, all toiling away on their own suborbital rockets, getting ready to shoot for 100 kilometers, and Delft ought to be there first. I think JFK put it pretty well 57 years ago when he said, because that challenge is one that we are so willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. And these three reasons, the potential of the design, our awareness of the pitch roll problem, and the intensifying competition mean we are ready and confident in accepting this challenge now. JFK mentions postponing. And the intention for most of this year has been to launch Stratos 4 in August of 2019, which means it should currently be in a container halfway between Rotterdam Harbor and Cape Town, where we found the perfect launch site in South Africa. Spoiler alert, you've probably guessed it, the rocket is in fact here. So what went wrong? As Edwin mentioned, delays in the aerospace industry are pretty commonplace, and the delay of Stratos 4's launch comes down to pretty similar factors. Budget and technical readiness. We've been aware of these problems for most of the year. However, as is the nature of any dream team, we consciously chose to work as hard as possible for as long as possible to overcome these problems. 
At the same time, we weren't willing to recklessly plow ahead towards an unrealistic launch date. So we chose a certain moment to step back and evaluate whether it was still feasible to launch Stratos 4 in the summer of 2019. And we made this decision mainly based on financial and technical readiness, giving them a go or no go judgment. Let's first take a look at technical readiness. <laughs> I imagine that most of you could probably tell me rocket engines aren't supposed to do that. However, that's what ours has spent most of this year doing. And it wasn't just the engine. The roll control thrusters, our electronics, and nearly every single system have presented smaller challenges to us this year, as Edwin also mentioned. These roll control thrusters I just mentioned are how we are planning to combat the pitch roll coupling we saw on Stratos 3. These are what we call a mission critical system. They're pretty similar to life support on the space shuttle to keep astronauts alive, or control flaps on a commercial aircraft, meaning you can turn and actually reach your destination. You need these things to complete your mission. If only we could tweak a rocket engines down until the final moment of launch. However, that's not really how rocket engines work. So if a mission critical system like this isn't ready to launch, we're simply not confident enough to give a full go for launch. Then to budget or to financial readiness. In order to safely conduct a rocket launch, you can't just go to wherever you want and launch off rockets. Instead, you need to clear a certain area of land, sea, and air, and completely evacuate it of people. And this is what launch sites take care of. For Stratos 3, we required an area of roughly 2,700 square kilometers to safely launch. If we were to plot that onto a map of the Netherlands, it would stretch from Delft, north to Almira, south to Tilburg, and then back to Delft. For Stratos 4, however, we need an area of roughly 7,000 square kilometers to safely conduct our launch, as we are going so much higher. Plotting this area stretches from Delft north to Zwolle, south to Venlo, and then all the way back to Delft. This increase in area that we need unfortunately results in a 10 times increase in the cost of launching. And we've spent most of this year working towards trying to find a source of funding for this cost. However, in the end, we weren't successful. Given another year, we are confident that we can gain the remaining amount of funds we needed for a full launch campaign, as well as finish all of these technical systems. An additional year also gives us the opportunity to properly test all of these systems, meaning when the clock finally reaches t equals zero, in the summer of 2020, we will have a drastically higher confidence in Stratos 4 making it all the way to space. Long term, we're looking into some possibilities where we can set up an agreement with a launch site for a discounted yearly launch or combining with some other European student rocketry teams to band together and have a combined launch campaign. But uh, the tasks that we've failed on are the minority. Uh, so let's focus on what we have achieved. In the last 10 months, we have built a rocket with an empty mass of just over 100 kilograms, powered by the most powerful student-built hybrid engine in the world, capable of lifting an SUV straight up into the air, equipped with the electronics needed to control this vehicle and communicate with us over 100 kilometers away, the recovery system needed to bring this capsule back from the edge of space, the simulations needed to make sure all of this occurs safely, and the outreach to tell this story to our over 14,000 social media followers. These achievements have come from the six different departments that we have in our team. So let's hear a little bit about the achievements and challenges that these departments have faced this year, starting with electronics. Oops. Thankfully, none of the rockets there has ever flown have carried a pilot nor do I think we could find one if we ever went out and tried. Instead, we trust these 10 people that we can communicate with and control Stratos 4 while it sits on the launch pad, that at T minus five, our ignition valve opens and our igniter fires, at T minus zero, our main valve opens, propelling Stratos 4 skywards, and then throughout the entire course of the flight that we monitor and receive the data from vibration sensors, acceleration sensors, temperature sensors, that we have the feed from our six onboard cameras and all of the data generated by our different payloads. 
Not only must all of this data be stored at very high rates, we also have to stream it back to the ground so that we in mission control can watch what's happening with the rocket. Not only must the electronics monitor this data, but at just the right moment, when it senses that we have reached the peak of our flight, it will command our separation system to open and push our capsule away from the spent tank and engine. Similarly, at just the right time, the electronics will command our drogue and main parachutes to be thrown out. Too early, and we will drift the hundreds of kilometers off course, and too late, and we'll slam back into the ocean at supersonic speeds. This communication and control is achieved using 20 different custom-designed and made printed circuit boards, or PCBs. And this year, our electronics team has faced quite a challenge in soldering and testing all of these PCBs, which Chief Electronics Simon will tell us a little bit about now. at some point. Now. <laughs> the testing took so... <sighs> the testing took so, so extremely long. We had to be finished, but then it took a few weeks longer and nothing worked during these weeks. When you design PCBs, there's probably something that's not working. For example, for this one, we discovered a short after we soldered all the components. And then there was a component here, uh, this small resistor, which uh, had some solder underneath, but we couldn't even see it. Uh, it took us a very long time to discover where it was. It was really demotivating for the team to uh, always have these, these type of problems. Sometimes it took people multiple full days to discover where the shorts are. During our weekly electronics meetings, we always tell our problems to the rest of the team and our, our challenges. For example, one of the meetings we discussed that we have these shorts and these soldering errors uh, quite often, and that it takes us quite a lot of time to find uh, where they are. So for now, we change our kind of strategy uh, to test these PCBs. Uh, so we're now soldering a small part of it, then we test that part, and if that's working correctly, then we solder the next part. And so we split it up in different steps, and if you discover an error somewhere, they know from which step it is. When the countdown clock hits zero, everything has to work perfectly. That's the moment you're all working for. My name is Simon Verklei, and I'm the Chief Electronics of Stratos for This might seem like a simple solution, but it involves a pretty important trade-off between soldering each of these PCBs step by step and taking the time in between these steps to check for these shorts versus soldering it all in one go and then spending many, many days trying to find which step the short was in. Thankfully, the electronics team overcame this challenge, meaning we have the electronics needed to monitor and control Stratos 4 as it streaks towards space. I mentioned that the electronics team is responsible for streaming back some of the information we have on board to mission control. However, we're simply not capable of streaming back all of the information we gather. For example, of the six cameras we have on board, we only stream back one of these camera feeds in 720p quality, which is a brilliant view to have from space. However, we'd really like all six cameras in full 1080 HD. So this is where the recovery department comes in. All of the data that we generate from our payloads and our cameras is stored on SD cards safely nestled inside of black boxes. And it's the recovery team's job to make sure that these black boxes sitting in our capsule make it safely back to Earth. Once our capsule separates from the tank, it's designed so that it tumbles, so it starts to spin around and bleed off some of the energy it has, meaning it will start to slow down. However, it's still moving at supersonic speeds. So at just the right moment, our drogue parachute is ejected out of the vehicle using a hot gas mortar system, meaning when the parachute inflates, it's far enough away from our capsule that it doesn't become entangled. This slows us down from supersonic to subsonic speeds. 
where, at just the right moment, our main parachute will be thrown out. This slows us down to roughly 15 meters a second. When it impacts the ocean, this is pretty comparable still to a 50 kilometer an hour car crash, but thankfully, our black boxes don't mind. The recovery system this year has developed this new hot gas mortar system to eject the drogue parachute. This works by taking a small amount of explosives, sitting it behind your parachute, that builds up just enough pressure to push it forward and break off the lid of the canister, throwing it clear of the capsule, a bit like this. One of the challenges they've faced is tweaking the amount of explosives needed to get just the right amount where you've got enough energy to eject your parachute forward, but not too much that you blow apart your canister entirely. Thankfully, they've almost got it narrowed down, meaning, meaning that we have the recovery system needed to safely return the Stratos 4 capsule all the way from the edge of space. Next to the propulsion department, the department everybody thinks about when they hear the word rockets. Rocket technology is the only technology capable of pushing us to this altitude that we're aiming for, or beyond into orbit, or beyond again into the rest of the solar system. The distance that we're going to travel, 100 kilometers, is roughly the distance between Delft and Eindhoven, and on a good day, you can drive that in around an hour and a half. However, our rocket travels that distance in just under three minutes. And during that three-minute ascent, the entire way it fights the force of Earth's gravity pulling it backwards, as well as uh, Earth's atmosphere causing uh, drag and pushing us back downwards. And it's the propulsion department's responsibility to generate, contain, harness, and direct the energy we need to overcome those forces. They do this with a 24, 26 kilonewton hybrid rocket engine. This works by taking nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, as our oxidizer, and burning it with our fuel, which is a mixture of paraffin, which is candle wax, sorbitol, which is coffee sweetener, and aluminium powder. At the bottom of every rocket engine, we have a nozzle, and it's the nozzle's job to take the pressure inside of the combustion chamber and direct it out the back, turning it into the energy to push us forward. And the most extreme condition this nozzle needs to handle is temperature. Typically, we make this part out of graphite, just like in your pencil, because it's very good at taking these temperatures. Unfortunately, it's very, very heavy. So this year, one of the most innovative parts that we've added is a 3D printed titanium nozzle. And this cuts eight kilograms off of our previous design. Similarly, the propulsion team has worked with the structures department to improve our combustion chamber design. The combustion chamber has to contain the 42 bar of pressure, 42 times the pressure we feel in this room, of the combustion process inside of it. And normally, we've used a five millimeter thick aluminum casing for this. By changing this to a carbon fiber composite combustion chamber, we've saved another seven kilograms off of the previous design. Now, engine testing this year, as you already saw, wasn't exactly smooth sailing, which chief, engine, er, chief propulsion, Zoe, will now tell us a little bit about. Did we have any challenges here? I don't know. Maybe only like every day. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of challenges with propulsion. Uh, it's kind of inherent to building a hybrid. And they talk about rocket science being hard. This is what they're talking about. It's like how propulsion is it's not very predictable and it requires endless motivation. In order for an engine test to be successful, you need like 100 things to go right, and if one thing goes wrong, your test will fail. Uh, so we had a lot of trouble when we started doing new raw casting. We had problems with the quality of the fuel, which required us to do it again and again. So there were some days where they would spend eight hours casting, and in the end, we couldn't use it because there was problems with the uh, air pockets in the fuel, and they were super bummed about it. But right away, they were just like, all right, what are we going to do differently? What do we do this time? We did this, we held it this long. How long do you think we should have held it? I think we should move this, we should try doing this, da da da. So it was like right away, they moved in from, yeah, okay, we're disappointed that it didn't work, but how are we going to solve it? And they worked, 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 worked. We're all learning. Like, how do you deal with successive failures? 
and not how do you not only see the failures when it's impending? Because behind every failed engine, there's also like tons of successes that have happened on the way there. And that can be hard. Um, and so that's, and it's not something that you can do by yourself. It's hard to do it alone. My name is Zoe Dicker, and I am the Chief Propulsion for Stratus 4. Now, we filmed this interview with Zoe just over two weeks ago, and that very weekend, our propulsion department had their very first full duration successful engine burn of the year. The delight that it caused. The delight that this caused, you can watch yourself on their own faces right now. Dead. <laughs> A really well-deserved victory for the propulsion team. Within this propulsion department, we also have our roll control system. We've chosen to combat the pitch roll coupling problem we saw on Stratos 3 by controlling the roll rate of Stratos 4. And we do this by adding four smaller rocket engines pointing sideways out of the vehicle. They work by taking some of the nitrous oxide we hold inside of our tank and decomposing it over a catalyst bed. In this chemical reaction, we release heat and pressure, and we direct it out the back of these engines to create thrust. They work in conjunction with an electronic gyroscope that measures how quickly we're rolling. If it sees that we're going above a certain roll rate, then they will fire the opposing thrusters to push our roll rate back under an acceptable threshold. Now, to achieve decomposition, we first have to heat this catalyst bed to over 600 degrees Celsius. And because we are flying a system that needs to both be lightweight, but also, hold in, or also have the thermal mass to hold in this heat, we've struggled to get up to the temperatures that we need for decomposition to occur. By reconfiguring the heating element that we have around the catalyst bed, we are now working towards, hopefully, our first successful decomposition burn. With our main engine now cooperating, we can work towards testing the titanium nozzle and the composite combustion chamber. And our roll control system is going to be tested soon to hopefully be added to Stratos 4 for its flight in the summer of 2020. Now, an engine with some parachutes and some PCBs on top won't get us very far, unfortunately. We need something to hold in this 42 bars of combustion pressure, to carry along our 174 kilograms of nitrous oxide, to protect the flight computer, some fins to keep us stable, and something to attach all of these different sections. In comes our biggest department, the structures department. They're responsible for designing, building, and testing nearly every single component in the rocket. Components that need to take some of the most extreme conditions of any vehicle while also remaining as lightweight as possible. One of the main focuses for this year's structures department has been weight saving, meaning many parts that we normally make out of aluminium have been replaced instead with carbon fiber, which is quite a challenge given how differently it behaves from aluminium. Every kg of weight that we save off of the rocket 
gains us another kilometer and a half in altitude, so every gram counts. The sheer number of parts that this structures team has had to deal with has proved to be one of their biggest challenges this year, which Chief Structures Birend will now tell us some more about. Our biggest challenge was designing and also manufacturing over 300 parts. When you look at the outside of the rocket, everything you see is made by us. And every single part was a challenge on its own. Making 300 parts takes a lot of time. We had a few months to produce all of this. Um, so we, we had to keep going every day. There was so much to do, we had to keep, keep going. Sometimes for weeks on end, full days, full nights. That's too much to do like anyone on the on the zone. So what we did is we split up the team for kind of the, the sections of the rocket, so nose cone, uh, recovery section, the tank uh, and the engine. Um, and everyone split up, got familiar with their parts, went full depth into designing them. Um, and then we shared all the knowledge uh, and in the end everyone helped uh, manufacturing their own parts. Um, and when necessary everyone helped each other out. When someone was stuck for time or they needed a part done quickly then you could always count on someone sharing up maybe even at 9 in the evening to work for well, deep into the night to finish the part. Yeah, with our team uh, we had a lot of people who were very motivated to help each other out. So over the last month when most parts were almost finished um, and we were almost ready to start assembling the entire rocket, um, everyone was really excited to keep on going. Um, we had way more people in, um, in the machine hall. Um, I think the, the manufacturing uh, rate doubled. Um, yeah, because we all wanted to see it finished and we were so close, so then everyone just dropped everything they were doing and um, helped out. At those moments you feel really proud of the work, the work you've done and the work we've done with the team. My name is Bernard van Leegoed and I'm Chief Structure for Stratus 4. Now, it came down to the final few days, almost the final few hours, but all of these 300 parts are now produced and assembled, sitting under this blanket ready to be unveiled, but not quite yet. Hmm? Yeah, all of these 300 parts. <laughs> More complex rockets, like those used by Ariane Group and SpaceX, can immediately guide themselves as soon as they take off. However, our rockets need to first build up a little bit of speed before they're stable on their own. And we achieve this by putting our rockets in a launch tower, built by the tower team. Most of the teams in Stratos like to build their parts out of aluminium, titanium, and carbon fiber, but instead the tower team prefers the comfort of concrete and steel. This year, because our launch site is so big, the tower team has focused on building a rocket cart that we can mount the rocket into and pull it around, around, pull it, uh, around the launch site behind the vehicle. And they've also built a roof mount for the rocket, which you might have seen outside, and hopefully you'll see a bit more of later too. So with all this ground infrastructure, we're ready to support Stratos 4 in its launch to space. I mentioned democratizing space as one of our goals, and to do this, we need to spread the story of what we're doing. That task falls to the business team. Every picture we take, every video we record, our monthly newsletters, our YouTube channel, our website, the renders, everything like that is entirely made by the business team. They have a task that's even more challenging than any field of rocket science, which is taking what comes out of an engineering student's mouth and translating it into something understandable by the general public. <laughs> Thanks to this outreach and their storytelling, we have many long established as well as, as well as many new partners, ensuring the financing and support we need to achieve our goals and get to space. And now the last department, simulations. I mentioned that we get one shot at launching, and it's the simulations team's responsibility to make sure that this shot counts. We can't take out our rocket to see what the performance is like or what our speed is like, so instead, we do many, many, many separate tests, like engine tests and roll control tests. 
And we also measure the parameters of the vehicle, so the mass of our components and their dimensions. And the simulations team models the real world and then predicts how high we will go. But our maximum altitude isn't the only important parameter they generate. I already mentioned this safety zone that we need to conduct our launch in. This safety zone is entirely evacuated of people, meaning that we can safely fly rockets and land them in this area. With inside this safety zone again, we have what we call a safe to fly zone. If the rocket starts to deviate off its nominal path and go towards the edge of this safe to fly zone, we will send a command from the ground to break it up, and the resulting debris will still land within this safety zone. All of these parameters for generating these zones and criteria for termination are generated by this team so a huge weight of responsibility sits on their shoulders, which Chief Simulations Danny will tell us about now. We all want to, want to achieve a uh, goal, which is reaching space, uh, reaching 100 kilometer altitude, and we have no way of knowing whether we will be able to do that other than simulating the rocket, so the entire team is putting faith in us uh, that uh, our model is accurate and uh, it won't be all the work for nothing. The beginning of the year, especially the first month, was very overwhelming for the entirety of the team because all of us had to familiarize the code which is made up of tens of thousands of lines. Uh, we grew quite a bit in uh, this process uh, as we got better at uh, at programming as we gained a deeper understanding of the code and by the end of the year we managed to create a method uh, used for creating a safe to fly zone that uh, is considered very accurate and uh, very well done. Once we presented our method to the launch site, they were quite explicit about uh, how confident they are with uh, our ways of dealing with our simulations. And uh, when you've got this group of really experienced uh, professionals uh, that have been working on with this stuff for several years now, and uh, then they give you a thumbs up by the end of the meeting, then that's something that really feels good and it's the best compliment that you could get. My name is Dani Atot, and I am Chief Simulations for Service 4. Now, Dani is pretty humble in this interview, but we've worked for over 19 years now with experimental rocketry, and we've never had a serious accident. So this is a very important reputation and practice for us to uphold. With this stamp of approval from the launch site on our simulations, we have the final go for hopefully proceeding with the launch of Stratos 4 in the summer of 2020. And our last group is the management team. All of the processes I just went over require a fair amount of coordination, and that task falls to us. Between team manager, external relations, chief engineer, and process manager, we monitor the work of all these six departments, we work on financing, events, logistics, and nearly any other task that doesn't fall under the other six departments. With regards to the challenges we face this year, I could say that we had to run a 70-person team, or that we had to take the really large decision of delaying our launch for the year, or reading through the hundreds of pages of legal documentation required to ship a rocket somewhere. But there's been one challenge that we faced every single week. Because we are the only four people who don't need to be on a technical meeting on a Wednesday evening, the monumental task of cooking dinner for 70 people falls to us. <laughs> the main lessons we've learned from it this year are that firstly, we should avoid rice, because we will always burn it. Secondly, that olives are not the favorite food of the Stratos 4 team. And thirdly, that no matter what you make, if you cover it with melted cheese, then the team will be happy with it. So, six departments, uh -oh. six departments, 10 months, 300 parts, 26 kilonewtons, two parachutes, 20 PCBs, and 14,000 social media followers. 
It all adds up to one rocket. We've heard about why we're going to space and why we think we're ready to go there now. And we've heard the challenges and achievements that it's taken us over the course of this year to get to this point. So I think it's, take, it's time we take a look at the rocket itself. Without much further ado, the moment we've all been waiting for. Ladies and gentlemen, Stratos 4. half-meter spectacle of carbon fiber when it's sitting on a launch rail, especially for the people it's pointing at. <laughs> <laughs> now, the aerodynamic shell on the outside hides most of the internals of the rocket. So, let's take a quick tour of what lies underneath. Firstly, to the nose cone. At the very tip, we have a 3D printed steel nose point. This is because as we rush through the atmosphere, the friction with the air causes it to heat up so much to 300 degrees Celsius that other materials wouldn't be able to withstand it. Below the tip, we have the shell, which is made of tvaron, a glass fiber-like material. This is radio transparent, so that the, telem er, that the telemetry antennas sitting inside can broadcast their signal through it. Below these telemetry antennas, we have our flight computer, made up of seven of the PCBs. These monitor the pressure data that's fed from the pressure sensors at the bottom of this section and command our parachutes and separation system to open at just the right time. In this section, we also have our battery management system, letting us charge Stratos 4 as it sits on the launch pad. And we have our two black boxes housing the SD cards with the precious footage and data. Below the nose tip, we come to the recovery bay the section that holds our two parachutes in these two canisters. On the top plate, we have five of the six cameras that we use to record our flight. And on the bottom plate, we have one more camera that will watch as our tank and engine drop away below the vehicle and hopefully get a beautiful view of South Africa beneath. It'll also watch as our main parachute inflates to bring us safely back down. And covering this bottom plate, we have a heat shield that protects these delicate fibers and ropes from the heating during atmospheric re-entry. Right below the recovery bay, we have the roll control section. At the very top, you can see the four springs that are used to push our capsule away from the tank. And below this, we have the electronics and valves that control the roll control thrusters. And below them, the thrusters themselves, pointing sideways out of the rocket to give us the force we need to control the roll rate. On the other end of the tank, we come to the engine bay. One of the big problems we've faced in the past is stiffness between all of these different joints. And this year, we've changed most of these interfaces to conical interfaces, so that these slanted faces, when bolted together, will align themselves properly and remain really rigid. At the top of this engine bay, we have a baffle that will stop the nitrous oxide from swirling as it goes through the feed system, like water does in your bathtub or in your sink. The feed system then routes the six kilograms per second of nitrous oxide down through a main valve and into the engine. The fill valve that we use to pump the nitrous oxide into the tank also sits in this section. And lastly, we have one of the most important systems in the rocket, the flight termination system, or FTS. This works with these two antennas pointing out of the side that receive a signal from the ground telling it to terminate. If it receives this signal, it will actuate an explosive cord that lines the shell and break the rocket in two, stopping our flight. And below the engine bay, we get to the engine. The inside of this is the composite combustion chamber that I previously spoke about. This takes 
all of the thermal and pressure loads that we need. Uh, because the engine isn't exactly the same diameter as the rest of the tank, we then have a foam layer that extends our diameter, and on top of that, another carbon fiber layer that we attach our fins to. At the very bottom, we have the graphite insert and the titanium nozzle that I already mentioned. Next year, Stratos 4, with its new members, will work on finalizing these few systems that aren't quite ready, as well as uh, gaining the remaining funding needed for a full launch campaign. Once all of these systems are brought to a full level of meeting their requirements, they can also work on optimizing them slightly further by either adding more functionality or cutting off more mass. Meaning, when we do launch, we might even get as high as 120 or 130 kilometers, really putting the record out of reach for a couple more years to come. Then this time, next year, we will pack everything up and ship it off to South Africa, where after four weeks of assembly, testing, and sleepless nights, we will reach the moment of truth and send Stratos 4 skywards on a pillar of flames. Then we will get to see if our electronics, our recovery, our structures, our propulsions and our simulations have all done their job, and the business team will keep you up to date no matter how late into the night our live stream ends up going. After working towards this for 10 years, we can wait one more before we reach our finish line. However, we really wouldn't have made it this far without our long-standing partners. In addition, we wouldn't be able to aim even higher than ever before without many of our new partners. Their belief in our project, materials, tools, financing, and advice make all of this possible. A decade on from when some D.A.R.E. students dared to dream even higher, we've built upon their work, faced the challenges of successive failure, testing the complexity of our vehicle, and ensuring that we keep ourselves and those around us safe to get to this moment, almost ready to shoot for space. Thank you very much. Please give one final round of applause to this 70-person team for their 10 months of hard work.